Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Natalie Marie Hart and you're watching the Natalie Marie Hart Show. You can check out other archives on my website www.crystalkidsradio.com or www.nallymariehart.com. I'm grateful for supporters who follow me on my social medias. My special guest is Laird Scranton. He's an independent researcher of ancient cosmology and language and he's searching for lost knowledge. In the early 1990s, he became interested in the Dogon tribe of mythology and symbolism. He has appeared on well-known shows such as Coast to Coast and Red Ice Radio. His la latest book was published by Inner Traditions, which is called The Mystery of Scarab Bray, Neolithic Scotland and the Origins of Ancient Egypt. His book is very educational. He's an expert in his field of work and I would recommend everyone to read them. I would like to present Laird Scranton to the show. Hi, Laird, how are you? Hi, Natalie, thank you very much for having me on. It's a pleasure to interview you today. Now, I understand that you are an independent software designer, but you found a new path in your life. I understand that we must credit your wife who had a lot to do with it. Why was the Dogon people such an interest to you? Well, I sort of stumbled on them accidentally because of a book, mm -hmm. as you say, my wife gave me um, that talked about uh, unexpected knowledge they had. The Dogon are, are, are a modern day African tribe, a primitive tribe that, um, you know, compared to what by Western standards live without uh, modern technology. And uh, they knew some things about the stars of Sirius they shouldn't know. And so I started exploring that and realized that it's a very interesting tribe. Uh, it's sort of a crossroads for three ancient religions, uh, Judaism and ancient Egyptian religion and the ancient Buddhist religions. And I thought, well, here's an opportunity to um, do some comparison to find, you know, to find all three of these influences in one culture gave an uh, opportunity to learn more about what the symbols and myths might mean. Yes, we will get into that later in the show. But before that, can you please be so kind to tell people where they can buy your books? Sure. Uh, my books are published by Inner Traditions, um, a company that's been in Rochester, for Vermont, for about 35 years. Um, their website is www.innertraditions.com. Uh, they're also affiliated with Simon & Schuster, so there's a page for me on simonandschuster.com. Uh, the books are available pretty much everywhere. I mean, you can get them on Amazon or any of the usual outlets. You could probably find one or more of them on the shelf at Barnes & Noble. Um, they're orderable from any bookstore. Well, then please check that out. So now I would like to ask you, what inspired you to write about Scarabray? And where is it located? Can you please be so kind to tell us about this? The Scarabray is considered to be the first farming village in northern Scotland. And mm -hmm. one of the interesting things about it, uh, it dates from a period of about 3200 BC, which is before dynastic Egypt. And one of the interesting things about it is that there are no official theories as to who the people were who were there or what they were really doing there besides farming. And so I had a distant friend from Australia ca contact me by email and ask if I thought there could be Egyptian influences there at 3200 BC. Now, I didn't know much about um, the United Kingdom or Scotland. I hadn't done much research into that, but I have studied um, comparative systems of of Africa, Egypt, India, China, Turkey, um, and other places. And so I thought, um, I know that the African tribe, the Dogon that I study, um, I think it looks as if they were Egyptian at 3200 BC. And so I thought I might find some commonalities there. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so when I looked into it, I mm -hmm. um, there isn't uh, Scarabray in northern Scotland isn't like ancient Egypt where you have you know endless murals and statues and symbols and papyrus writings and things you know the endless evidence that ancient Egypt provides for for people to interpret. In northern Scotland, all we really have is some architecture and a few artifacts. There's um, a couple of ancient languages that were spoken. Um, on Orkney Island, which is which is where Scarabray is located, um, there's there's a series of megalithic sites that were built there over a period of 600 years, and so there's not a whole lot of of information to go on. So I started, you know, looking very generally. 
could the village uh, did the, the village look stylistically like it could have come out of the traditions of a setting? And and in overview, it did look like it could have. Um, eventually, I got down to architectural forms within the village and discovered that all of the original houses at Scarborough were built to a particular plan, and it, it's an unusual plan. It, in, it includes a, a round room at one end that the researchers in Scotland refer to as a beehive shape. They think it's a unique feature because they don't find it anywhere else. Um, it has two rectangular side rooms and a square central room and then a rectangular entryway at the, at the bottom. Now, I... Mm -hmm happened to discover that the Dogen, okay, the Dogen live in Mali, which is a very, in a de the south of Mali, which is very desert country. Mm -hmm. and so they tend to build out of mud, not out of stone. But when they do build out of stone, the house is built to the same basic plan that the Scarabray house has. And so I, I looked into that and discovered that there's symbolism associated with the shape, that what the house is supposed to represent is a sleeping woman or a sleeping goddess. And the round room is her head. The side rooms are her arms. The central room is her body cavity. And at the center of that is a square, in, at least on Orkney Island, there's a square hearth that represents the heart. And the entryway at the bottom represents her sexual parts. Mm -hmm. And so realizing that I had connections between the architecture and uh, to the Dogen, that now opened the door for me to try to interpret things on Orkney Island in relation to the Dogen cosmology and their language. Now, there's an ancient language in northern Scotland called Faroese. And I discovered that there are all sorts of words, you know, names of places and designations for uh, structures and megalithic sites and so forth, that in northern Scotland, they're not sure where the word comes from. They can't trace the root back to anything definite. But when you start comparing it to the Dogen words and the ancient Egyptian words, the meaning plays right out. It's very clear why the thing was called what it was called. Um, so in my book, I use language and symbolism to try to explain what these structures on Orkney Island represent. Mm -hmm. Yes, how interesting. And how do you think the Dogen tribe make, made it to Scotland? Did they use boats? Well, the, my, my perspective coming into this was that what, what I was looking at was Egyptian influences on Scotland. Now, at 3200 BC, the Dogen, I think, were Egyptian, so we're really talking about how did the Egyptians get to Scotland. But the more I looked at it, the more the evidence started turning up contradictions. For example, um, with the house plan, there's the hearth in the center of the building, but the Dogen don't have that hearth down in, in Mali. There's, they don't have a hearth inside the house. It's a hot climate. They don't need a hearth. And so I thought it was very interesting that on northern Scotland, they added the hearth in keeping with the symbolism of the house. They added it where the heart should be. It wasn't for a while that I started to figure out that I might have my, my concept reversed, that maybe the Scarabray House was the original house, and the mm -hmm. reason the Dogen don't have the hearth is because they didn't need it. They removed it. And so more of the evidence was starting to look like that, that and even the timing of it. At 3200 BC, um, there is no credible researcher who thinks that the Egyptians could have mounted an expedition all the way over to Scotland at 3200 BC. Well, why so, you, but why do you think the Egyptians went to Scotland? See, I, I, my perspective now is that they didn't. My perspective is that whoever was in northern Scotland was a precursor to what we see in Egypt. Oh, I see. And so um, what you have on Orkney Island, this series of megalithic sites, are these are recognizable shapes. There's a series of shapes in a row that are all cosmological. They represent a progression of how creation of matter happens. But they're built on a life-size scale, and they were connected by a road back at 3200 BC, and they led right to this village. And so it looked as if what they had there was um, an instructional site that a person could walk through, uh, sort of like sometimes you go to a museum and they'll have a display about the human body where you can walk through the chambers of the heart or walk through the you know other structures of the human body. Well, that's sort of what this presents like. And so... Um, I started looking at it from that point of view and realized that uh, the names of the megalithic sites um, supported that idea, that 
these this sequence of shapes begins with um, a standing stone that represents like a geometric point. And then they progress to a stone circle that represents the concept. Actually, they would have progressed to a, to a line next. There was a, an idea that there was originally a second stone that, that in combination with the first stone would have produced a geometric line. And then a circle, and then a mound, a hemisphere like a burial mound. And then finally to a cluster of eight houses. Now that sequence is cosmological. That's the way that, that string theorists say the matter forms. That's the way the Dogen say the matter forms. This is a scientific set of structures, arguably. And so the implication is that whoever put these structures together at 3200 BC somehow understood the science of it. They understood what these shapes were supposed to look like. Wow. And what language do they speak, Ascobor? Um, the, uh, the original language there, there were two languages that are old there. Um, there's not a lot of written history there, so it's hard okay. to know for certain. One of the languages is called Norn, and it's based on Norwegian. Okay. And another language is Faroese, and part of what I do with my book is I demonstrate mm -hmm. commonalities between that Faroese language and the Dogen and Egyptian languages. That word after word after word, like when I was trying to uh, um, examine the shape of the house uh, at Scarabray, I looked at Faroese words and discovered that the room that means kitchen also comes from the same root that means head. And the room, the word for the, for the uh, concept of a bedroom also comes from a root that means arm. And so you have linguistic confirmation that these structures represented what the Dogen say they represent. Mm -hmm. Right. And what similarities are there between Globeki Tepi and Scarborough? Um, there's a very big time difference between the two, and so it's uh, tricky to try to make linkage. Um, at Gobekli Tepe, we have elements of the same system of cosmology, the same symbolic system uh, in a very early form is presented. Gobekli Tepe is in Turkey, and it's uh, the earliest constructed site that we know about. It dates from around 10,000 BC, and it's on a hilltop um, near the Fertile Crescent in southeastern Turkey. Um, a lot of the animals, carved animals that are pictured on pillars at Gobekli Tepe are animals that are important to this, uh, symbolically to the system of cosmology, and they're the same animals that are important to the, the cosmology the Dogen preserve. Mm -hmm. So we have that. Um, I've also written another book called Point of Origin that traces what we see at uh, Gobekli Tepe down through India and into Egypt at around 4,000 BC in the south at a place called Elephantine. And you see all the same concepts and a lot of the same words and um, religious um, rituals and things like that um, all down through that progression. How interesting. That must sound like a fun book to read. <laughs> well, it was a fun book to write, that's for sure. <laughs> that's good. Um, the problem is that when you get into eras that old, it's before written language, and so it becomes tricky to try to, to mm -hmm. demonstrate what the people thought. And there's some techniques of language that can be used to do that, or like with Scarabray, you can use architecture to demonstrate it, but it's a little bit tricky. I know, it must be really difficult because it's so old, ancient, right? Yes, it is very, very old. But just came to my mind this question, were any hieroglyphs or symbols found at Scarborough? There are some written symbols that were found there, but um, not much that we can um, do anything with. There's one sun glyph there that is also found at um, um, Newgrange in Ireland that is a close match mm -hmm. for an Egyptian glyph. Um, but this... Uh, is the era that would have predated written language in, in Egypt. Um, written language appears in Egypt about uh, 200 years after this. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not surprising if the sites were related that we wouldn't see um, written language in Scarabray. Mm -hmm. Right. And how many people populated this area at Scarabray? During well, at, at 4,000 BC, we have family farms, so um, very small communities. Scarabray had eight chambers that they think might have housed up to 20 families. Huh? But uh, there are other sites on Orkney Island that show that eventually there were much, you know, quite a few more people there than that. And these, these 
huge megalithic stones that they moved and set up in places um, would have required a fair number of people to do it. And they would have required somebody who had enough free time to be able to spend their time doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's hard to know for sure how many people. Um, Now, this progression of shapes I was talking about that leads to the eight clustered houses, when we're talking about how matter forms, those those eight clustered houses um, correspond to something in string theory. It's the first finished structure of matter called the Calabi-Yau space. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a cluster of, of collapsed bubbles. Um, mm-hmm. And one of the way to think, ways to think about it is when you use a, a bubble wand to try to blow soap bubbles, um, a lot of people notice that the first bubbles they try to blow pop. They don't, they don't have enough tensile strength to be able to hold their shape. And so it takes a little while before you're able to blow one that holds it, its own shape. And that's sort of the same way with matter, that it looks as if the very first... Um, encirclings of matter aren't strong enough to hold up, and so they collapse down into this little cluster. And so the Scarabrae site looks like it was symbolic of that cluster. Mm-hmm. Um, that's important because um, one of the questions I ask, I knew that the Dogen system of matter goes well beyond that little cluster. It goes all the way up to talking about how atoms form and how protons and electrons and neutrons form atoms. And so I wondered if there might have been an attempt to represent some of the the following shapes beyond the clustered village. Uh, In the Dogen um, mindset, scientifically what they're talking about is how how particles um, emerge against what's called the background field. This is what modern scientists say. And the way the Dogen represent that is with an actual agricultural field. And before they plant their crops, they go to the field of their highest priest, who's called the arrow priest, and they make they draw the equivalent of, of what looks like a crop circle with um, zigzag lines through it in the middle of this field before they plant their seeds. That they are supposed the zigzags are supposed to represent the vibrations of matter. So, knowing that we're talking about an era that would have been Egyptian, not Dogen. I thought, well, maybe the Egyptians have a similar comment, uh, concept. So I looked for the Egyptian word for field, and one of the words is pronounced seket. Mm-hmm. And the, the comparison to the field of the Aru priest for the Dogen would be a, a, an Egyptian concept called seket Aru. But that's also the Egyptian concept of the field of reeds, which is um, the way they conceptualize their, their heaven, the place where people... You know, a spirit would go after death. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the interesting parts of it is that just as the Dogen use an actual real-world field to represent a symbolic concept, the Egyptians also talked about their field of reeds on two levels, one that was symbolic and one that was geographic. I mean, there are paintings done of the, what the, you know, the pharaoh working the fields, the agricultural fields in the second era. And they, the paintings show pictures of animals that were supposedly in the second arrow, and they were, they're all animals that are indigenous to Orkney Island. Uh, the concept passed down to the Greeks as the Elysian fields, and the Greeks were even more specific. They talk about the geography of how to get to the Elysian fields, and they talk about what the place was like. They describe an island like Orkney Island. They describe it as being brilliantly white, and there are brilliant white wheat beaches on on Orkney Island. They describe it as being a place of great winds, which is also characteristic of Orkney Island. And they talk about different things that they even refer to it by the name Okeanos, which is very close to Orkney. So there's a lot of reason to think that um, Orkney Island might have represented the real world geographic place that the Egyptians called the Field of Reeds. And in Egyptian mythology, they actually place that place they locate that place to the west. Um, modern um, interpreters imagine that to be the west bank of the Nile, but the Greeks are saying it's actually the west, the, the far edge of the Western Ocean, which is where Orkney, Orkney Island is. Mm-hmm. Yes. And may I get into uh, a documentary that you were on? Dr. Carmen Balta did a documentary called The Pyramid Code. She's one of my dear friends. And you were, that's how I found your incredible work. 
right? And you have a book called Sacred Symbols of the Dogon, the Key to Advanced Science in the Ancient Egyptian Hieroglyphs. This particularly caught my attention because you provided a new way of reinterpreting Egyptian hieroglyphs. Don't you think it helped that you were an independent software designer? Um, yeah, it helped a lot that I was an independent software designer. My work as a programmer involved mm -hmm. um, it was basically symbolic work. Yes. Um, and there were choices I made as a programmer about how I um, mm -hmm. represented certain things symbolically that led me to believe that the Dogen system had been a design system, not a, not just a random system. Someone had I could see someone had been making choices about these symbols that were intelligent choices, mm -hmm. the same choices I would have made if I was writing a program. Um, mm -hmm. The Egyptian language actually helps me a lot in this whole process because of the way that the words work. Um, I can give you a simple example. There's an Egyptian word for week, like days of the week. And it's written with just two glyphs, so it's it's fairly easy to, to get your arms around. And the first glyph is a circle with a dot. That's the Egyptian sun glyph, and it can represent the concept of a day. And mm -hmm. the second glyph, upside down, that is the Egyptian number 10. And so I looked at the symbols of the word, and I said, symbolically, that says to me 10 days. And I did some research and discovered that the Egyptians had a 10-day week. Mm -hmm. Now, later on, when I was writing a book about China, I discovered their ancient word for week was written with two glyphs, their sun glyph and their number 10, and they also had a 10-day week. And so that one simple word provides us with a demonstration of how the ancient Chinese language was conceptually just like the ancient Egyptian language. How interesting. See, there is like always a similarity between each culture and language. Mm -hmm. Well, could you please be so kind to share the Dogon's people myth of creation and how it relates to other myths? Yes. Um, the Dogon have what's called an, an esoteric tradition. A lot of ancient cultures did. Mm -hmm. And the esoteric tradition, the idea behind it is that there's a body of important knowledge that the tribe feels dedicated to preserving, but that it only wants to make available to people who are responsible and who are dedicated. And so there's a dynamic set up between priests and other tribe members. If, if you were a priest and I was a tribe member, mm -hmm. and I ask you a question that you feel is appropriate to my status as a, a student, then you're obligated to give me a, a truthful answer to my question. Definitely. But if anybody asks you a question that's not appropriate to their status, you're obligated to remain silent. And so that sets up a dynamic where only the person who continues to be curious about it and continues to ask the next appropriate question is the one who eventually gets to the bottom of that body of knowledge. Now in Dogen uh, culture, that can, that can be any person. It can be a man or a woman. It can be an outsider to the tribe. The French anthropologists who studied the tribe, um, one of them dedicated 30 years to asking these kinds of questions and was eventually um, admitted as a Dogen citizen. He was buried as a Dogen citizen when he died. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And uh, the Egyptians had a very similar process. Uh, a lot of the Greek philosophers talk about, and there, there are rumors that Greek, Greek philosophers spent upwards of 20 years in Egypt studying with priests, and that a lot of their philosophies came out of the Egyptian culture. And yes, yes, you do see the connection, but what, can you please be so kind to share to us the similarities that you did find between the Dogon and Egyptians? A few examples? Yes, uh, they're, they're pervasive. Um, starting with um, civic practices, Pretty much anything that the Dogen do, you can demonstrate that the ancient Egyptians did at the very start of their civilization. Um, by comparing things the Dogen, uh, you know, practices the Dogen's ha Dogen have um, with Egyptian practices, and also comparing practices the Dogen don't have that the Egyptians had very early on, you can sort of place the time frame. Um, the Dogen have all of the same calendars the Egyptians had, but they don't have the leap years, the five intercalary days that the Egyptians adopted very early. 
Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the Dalgren cosmology is given in ancient Egyptian words mostly, but they don't have a written language, which was also a very early feature of ancient Egypt. Uh, so um, there are pervasive similarities uh, between the two cultures. A, a large part of what I do in my books is um, mm-hmm. compare words. Um, the advantage of the Egyptian root word being written down is that just like that word for weak, the symbols that are used to write the words explain to, to a person what the concept meant. Um, there's meaning to each of these symbols, and the meanings of the symbols are actually devi- defined by certain Egyptian words, and other meanings are defined by Dogen drawings. And so you can start to sort out what an Egyptian word means because it tells you what it means. Uh, their word for seasons says three arcs of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Mm-hmm. Well, that's odd. Aren't there four seasons? And I did research again and discovered, well, the Egyptians only had three seasons. They, they um, paid attention to a rainy season, a planting season, and a harvest season. Mm-hmm. So, the, again, the form of the word um, pointed me to facts about the culture that I didn't know before I looked at the word. And, and all of the words worked that way. Mm-hmm. Yes, I was impressed because you did use that symbolism of the Dogons like a Rosetta Stone. That was quite incredible. Well, I needed it. There are about 30 uh, Dogen drawings. So when the Dogen priests talk about a concept, a cosmological concept or a concept of creation, they say, they joke that they are, they are incapable of talking about it without also drawing it. And so there's a set of about 30 of those drawings that take the same shape as Egyptian glyphs and ha- carry the same meanings as the, the corresponding Egyptian glyph. And so I sort of use those as my starting point. And I started working with very, very simple Egyptian words like that word for week to try to get a sense of how do these words work. And then by you know, using the Dogen Dictionary where they tell me what the word means and then going to the Egyptian Dictionary and seeing what the Egyptologist thought the word meant, you start to be able to, to draw correlations back and forth between the two dictionaries. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a huge piece of what goes on with my work even now. Mm-hmm. I have a book about the Maori in New Zealand that's at the publisher right now, and uh, a lot of it rests on word comparisons to various languages that I've studied in other cultures. So when do you plan on publishing that book? Um, The the way that inner traditions normally works is it it takes them the better part of a year to to publish a book. So I would say the timing is likely to be in the fall of 2017 or maybe the winter. Oh, I see. Okay, then. I understand. And can you give us a little bit more detail, or how much can you give us about it? Oh, yes. It's a, it's actually a follow-on to the Sky of Ray book, okay. because the Orkney Island site got abandoned around 2600 BC for reasons that nobody's quite sure of, and no one is also sure where the people who were there went to. Um, in the earliest Scandinavian reports, um, the Scandinavians in ta- encountered two groups living side by side on Orkney Island. One they described as um, pygmies of very strange habits. And the other group was um, a set of average sized people um, who were clerics and who always wore white and who were so different from the Scandinavians as to constitute a different race. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the same dynamic the Dogen describe for their symbolic system, which they saw as an instructed tradition. They said said that um, eight of their tribes people were sequestered at a remote, remote location and instructed in the secret system and then sent back um, to teach the rest of the tribe members. Mm-hmm. They were also taught civilizing skills like um, things that were important for agriculture, all of the prerequisites for agriculture, like being able to track seasons and being able to um, have a way of telling time. And um, ha- they were taught how to weave cloth and how to um, how to make clay pots and how to um, um, domesticate animals, things like that. Yeah. That sounds like an interesting book, and I look forward to when it comes out because I would like to interview you as soon as that happens. Thank you. Now, the, fo- the follow-on book follows the, mm-hmm. the trail or the likely trail of those um, people who left, the pygmies who left, and uh, also the clerics, uh, too. Um, mm-hmm. Then it looks as if they moved down into the U.K. Uh, the timing is right for the appearance of 
a reported appearance of pygmies in Ireland and Lower Scotland and in, in Britain. Um, there are eventual reports much later on that um, the pygmies left Ireland, that they left. Uh, one myth says they went across the Western Sea by boat, and the other report says they went to the underworld. Mm -hmm. Well, in New Zealand, they have sort of mirror image myths. They say that the first inhabitants of New Zealand arrived by boat from the Western Sea, mm -hmm. and the ancient name for New Zealand means first circle of the underworld. So they sort of affirm, uh, simultaneously affirm both myths in Ireland. Uh, there are also um, stone structures in Ireland. One of the common stone structures in Ireland is a stone circle, uh, I mean, a hemisphere. And they're found everywhere, and nobody knows for sure what they're used for. But when you go to the Maori in New Zealand, you discover they have those same hemispheric stone structures, and they represent tribal schools. Every, every village had a school where they were teaching the same concepts I'm saying were taught, at, taught on Orkney Island. Mm -hmm. That sounds interesting, and I did read, I got, I got it at the chance to read some of your book about Orkney Island, and it was really great, I must say. Thank you. <laughs> it was. I was surprised uh, because, as I said, coming into it, I didn't really know that much about it, but with a couple of key pieces falling in place, you know, an entire book's worth of information came together. These were sort of loose ends I had left over from other studies, um, and... Um, they pulled together coherently to explain what was going on on Orkney Island. Mm -hmm. Well, I do understand that you originally wanted to call that book the Over From Boat. What was the reason for that? <laughs> Some The material often comes sort of tagged with a name, like the book Point of Origin. The sources that I was using to verify the information I was writing about kept referring, the authors of those sources kept referring to um, their piece of it as, oh, this is this, the point of origin of agriculture, or this is the point of origin of, of um, some aspect of religion. And they used the phrase over and over and over and over again, and I realized that my book needed to be called Point of Origin. Mm -hmm. Well, with this book, the, the phrase that kept turning up again and again and again was overthrown boat. It's a metaphor. It's the idea, uh, an idea that relates to the uh, tipping of the Earth's axis in a way that would melt the ice caps and cause a, cause great flooding and, and mm -hmm. cause great upheaval. Uh, the word scarabray, if you compare that to Egyptian words, ties to, it's actually two words, ties to words that mean over, overthrown or overturned boat. And there are several other references or threads of reference relating to the scarabray book that bring us back to that same concept again, overthrown boat, overthrown boat, overthrown boat. So, as an author, my impulse was to let the material present its own name and use it. And actually, the mystery of Scarabray is a is a, uh, a better, much better title if you're trying to posture it for sale in a bookstore. That's true, but I'm glad. I'm sure everybody will enjoy it as soon as they read it. It's really good, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot about it that surprised me as I, as I was going through it. Uh, the the um, things I would wonder if they could be true and then discover they actually were. Um, in August of this year, my adult son and I went to um, the British Isles and actually visited Orkney Island and Scarabray. And there's a set of islands north and west of that called the Faroe Islands that um, we got there and I thought, uh, it suddenly occurred to me that my book was already pretty well under publication. It was too late to change anything in it right now. What if I stumbled across something that completely mm -hmm. undercut argument I was trying to make in my book. <laughs> but that's not what happened. Oh, thank goodness, because then after you would have had to edit it again, and <laughs> that, that would have been really difficult. And sometimes you do find new information when you're doing research, right, and you just want to add it in. Now you understand completely. And um, yeah, you, were talk you were talking about Gobekli Tepe. Yes. Back in, at 10,000 B.C., these instructional sanctuaries seem to have been located in high mountaintop places. And my feeling has been that one of the reasons for that is that the instructors who were teaching the civilizing skills needed a safe place for themselves to be that was safe from us. And so when I was looking, researching Scarabray and Orkney Island, I realized that Orkney Island is right out in the middle of everywhere. It's completely accessible. 
ocean currents from the Atlantic would lead a boat right to it. It has very easy harbors for a boat to land at. There's no safety at all on the island. Oh, um, and so I asked myself, well, where would the safe haven be for the, the instructors? If they had to protect themselves from somebody, where would they go to do that? Well, just across the water to the north and west are the Faroe Islands, F-A-R-O-E. Now, from one perspective, it sounds a little too precious that the word Pharaoh, F-A-R-O-E, might relate to the word Pharaoh in Egypt. But from another perspective, commonality of, of sound is a key to the system of symbols I'm studying. And so it's almost required that you check to see whether there could be a connection. Uh, the Egyptian priest felt that way, and so did the Dogon priest. Well, I discovered that the Faroe Islands have all sorts of natural protections. Mm -hmm. They're characterized by 200-foot-high um, mm -hmm. sheer cliffs that the water um, slaps up against. It would smash a boat against the cliff, and that prevents people from landing on the island. Uh, there are um, whirlpools of water that can sink a boat between the islands. There are shallow shoals on the far side that a boat could run aground on. There are almost daily storms, little yeah. twister storms that come up the channels between the islands that don't affect the people who are on top of the islands but would sink a boat if it happened to encounter one. So it's a very well naturally defended spot. Yeah, it must and be. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, please. You go ahead. I like this. Well, it, it seemed to me that that, that was a natural um, answer to the question of where was the safe haven for these guys. Mm -hmm. Now, what's really interesting is that it's a very scenic spot also. There's a, there are very intriguing landforms there and mountain shapes and things like that. Now, around 2600 B.C. in Egypt, about the same time that Orkney Island was being abandoned, a pharaoh comes to power in Egypt who names himself Sene Pharaoh. In other words, Sene means image of or reflection of, and Pharaoh is Pharaoh. And this is the guy who starts building pyramids. But he doesn't build your standard um, geometrically shaped pyramid. He starts building pyramids that are sort of oddly shaped, like he built the what's called the bent pyramid, the pyramid that changes angles inexplicably halfway up. And he built a couple of other pyramids that the shapes are so odd that the, the Egyptologists think they must have degraded to the point where they look like this, that they might not have originally looked like that. But when you compare those shapes to some of the most prominent mountaintops in the Faroe Islands, you realize that they are, they are a match. There's a major uh, mountain in the Faroe Islands that changes angle halfway up just like the Bent Pyramid does. Um, basically, all four of the pyramids that Sene Pharaoh built um, bear a strong resemblance to mountaintops in the Faroe Islands. Oh, so it looks to me as, as if this guy might have been nostalgic for that place, the same way I might be nostalgic for college, and tried to replicate these things. Mm -hmm. Wow, that sounds like an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. Could I, could you, well, you see, there's a lot of connections between all of these civilizations, and some people do claim that it could be extraterrestrial contact. Do you agree with that? That's a, a very thorny question, a very hard question to get a perspective on. Originally, for me, that fell in the category of an open question, one that I didn't have enough information to be able to answer. But as time went on, I discovered that I have two matching symbolic systems, one that's Buddhist and one that's Dogen. And they're given in different languages, so it's not likely that one of them just adopted it from the other. And they're both, we can demonstrate that they're both ancient systems. Mm-hmm. And so it looks as if both cultures manage to keep all the um, complex details of these symbolic systems straight, independent of each other for thousands of years, from maybe 700 BC to our time. Modern authorities on Buddhism understand these symbols the same way that a modern Dogen priest does. And what that says is that neither system has changed in thousands of years, otherwise they wouldn't still match. Now, the Buddhists flatly claim that their most sacred symbols were given to humanity by a non-human source. The Dogen also say it was a non-human source, but they take it a step further. They say not only was it non-human, but it was also originally non-material. Now, the way to understand that is 
that in the archaic philosophies that underlie this whole system of symbols, the concept is that universes form in pairs, one material and one non-material, and that um, there's a flow of energy between the two universes that's as essential to life on, on Earth as the natural water cycle it is, you know, the cycle of um, water evaporating to form clouds, creating rain over the mountains, then flowing back to the oceans. If we didn't have that cycle, we wouldn't have life. Well, the Dogener is saying that if we didn't have this cycle of energy between the two universes, there also wouldn't be life in our universe. Mm -hmm. So the Dogen perspective is that at some period in remote history, a group that had originally been non-material managed to um, take form and action in the, in the material universe mm -hmm. and were able to instruct us in the system of cosmology. Uh, but because both cultures are saying the same thing, as a researcher, I, that puts me in a hard position. I can, I can imagine that they both managed to keep all these intimate details straight, but somehow forgot who they got the symbols from and somehow misremembered in the same way where who they got it from. They both misremembered that they got it from a non-human source. Or I can take the easier approach and say, not only did they keep the details straight, they also kept that last fact straight, that, that I have to consider the possibility that there could be a non-human influence. Mm -hmm. I wondered who their influence was. Hmm. <laughs> well, but from their, their yeah. perspective, mm -hmm. The primary influence that, that relates to the system of symbols was not from another planet, mm -hmm. but from another, from a sister universe, basically. Wow, that, that's quite interesting. I, let's say that for now. And what knowledge of Ceres did the Dogon have? Where do you think this knowledge of that came from? Do you think it might be from the extraterrestrial? They knew, okay, Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky from our perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, the easy way to find Sirius in the night sky is if you can find Orion, you can see the three belt stars of Orion and follow the imaginary line down from that belt, those belt stars and it points right to Sirius. Now, the Dogen understood that Sirius isn't just one bright star. There are actually at least two stars there. There's also a second um, dwarf star, a very condensed, um, massive, tiny star and it's in a binary orbit with the bright star of Sirius. Uh, you can't uh, readily see the dwarf star because it mostly sits in the glare of the bright star. And so if you look at it with a telescope, it's hard to even see that it's there. Now, the Dogen who don't have telescopes shouldn't even know that it's there. But not only did they know it, they also knew the correct orbital period of 50 years for the two stars. Uh, Carl Sagan tried to make the argument that the reason the Dogen knew this is because some modern person in modern times visited with them told the facts and that they adopted those facts. But there are problems with that argument. The first problem is that the Dogen references about Sirius are given using ancient Egyptian words that went out of use around 750 BC. And so the idea that any modern visitor would have given them that information using Egyptian words doesn't make sense. The second problem is that in Egypt, the Egyptian myths tell us that the goddess Isis, who, who we know represented Sirius, um, had a dark sister named Nephthys. Yes. And so those myths seem to indicate that the ancient Egyptians had the same knowledge the Dogen did. They understood there were two stars there. So now that information, okay, a person in my field of study um, has is required to rely on um, statements of the cultures they're studying for inter to form their interpretations. Uh, there's too much of a risk because of the way the human brain and imagination works uh, that I might see a pattern in something that isn't really a real thing. Um, and so I try to always um, begin the interpretation with a clear statement on the part of the culture. The, the Dogans say that where they got their information from was from informed teachers in ancient times who mm -hmm. understood more about astronomy than they did. Um, we can demonstrate that that's true because the Dogen also know the of the existence of a 
an almost invisible structure called Barnard's Loop. It's a spiral that centers on the belt stars of Orion. It's yeah. a birthplace of stars. And the Dogen correctly describe it and correctly describe where it's located. Um, but it's something they shouldn't know about without telescopes. But all of that is just a tiny tip of an iceberg compared to the details they know about creational science. They, the way they look at things, there are three creational themes that are important. One is how the universe forms. Another one is how matter forms. And the third one is how biological reproduction happens. Mm -hmm. And for the Dogen priests, those processes are so similar to each other, so parallel to each other, that they simultaneously describe all three processes using one progression of symbols. Mm -hmm. That's what part, part of what makes the symbols so hard to understand, is because it's not really a fair question to ask what does a symbol represent, because yeah. it represents one thing if we're talking about how matter forms, and it represents a slightly different thing if we're talking about how biological reproduction happens. As an example, mm -hmm. the shape of a hemisphere represents the womb of a woman who's pregnant, if we're talking about biological reproduction. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about how matter forms, it represents the expansion of mass as we're trying to form particles. Mm -hmm. uh, so the structure of matter is correct. I mean, you can set the Dogen descriptions and drawings side by side with the best science we have right now, and any person can look at it and see that you've got a match all the way from waves all the way up to atoms. And it's a a fairly complicated progression of stages and concepts. And the Dogen have them right. So when the Dogen say that they got their information from somebody who knew more about science than they did in ancient times, you almost have to accept that as true when you realize that they're talking about things that both they and ancient cultures shouldn't have been able to know. Mm -hmm. Yes, and as I listen to you, I see your point, because the doggone did seem to be really advanced in their ways. Mm -hmm. Right, but but without yeah. actually having the technology, it's not like they're building nuclear reactors, yes, but course. they understand how uh, what the components of an atom are. Of course, but they do understand the ideas, and that's where it comes in. Right. So Terex system is designed in a way to be self-reinforcing. It mm -hmm. basically merges these concepts of creation with civilizing skills and so that they reinforce each other. The idea is that when a Dogen tribes person goes out and plows a field, they're using a process that replicates what happens with matter. Or when, they, when a Buddhist builds a shrine, a stupa shrine, they're using, uh, basing it on a plan and on geometry that is scientific. This is fundamental to the way matter forms. And so that self-reinforcing system, we know with ancient Egypt that it was so coherent it held together for about 3,000 years. In Dogen culture, it looks to have held together for at least 5,000 years. This is a very coherent um, system. Mm -hmm. Well, there's one thing that we haven't mentioned in this interview, which I would like to bring up, if you don't mind. Uh, actually... May I quote you in your book? You quote, you stated in your book, The Mystery of Scarborough, one title that the Dogon give to their ancestor teachers is Namo. What does the term Namo mean, and what is it in the Dogon mythology? The, the way that words are formed in these cosmologies, this, these cosmologies preceded written language, so phonetics um, carry meaning. The word nu for the Dogen and the Egyptians means mm -hmm. it refers to water or waves. The word ma means to perceive. Now, as matter forms, the first thing that happens to cause matter to, to catalyze the formation of matter mm -hmm. is an act of perception um, perceives a wave, matter in its wave-like form. And as soon as that wave is perceived, suddenly its behavior inexplicably changes from that of a wave into that of a particle. Numa or numo means waves perceived. Now that's also an appropriate word to describe somebody who came out of a non-material universe but is now acting in a material one. It's basically the material universe being able to perceive something that was originally wave-like. 
And so the name that they gave the teachers um, corresponds, it sort of supports the idea of what they're saying happened. What's interesting is that I had said they were, that these, uh, one of the groups on the Orkney, on Orkney Island were the pygmies, who I take to be these Numo teachers. An Egyptian word for pygmy was nema, and in Egyptian hieroglyphic language, they don't know for sure what the vowel sounds were, so nema might very well have been Numo. Mm-hmm. So again, the Egyptian language supports what the Dogen are telling us yeah. and what Scarabrea is telling us, that we had a group of odd pygmy-sized teachers involved with um, average-sized clerics, which is what the Dogen are, who always wear white, at the right period of time, 3200 BC, to just precede um, the first agriculturally-based kingship in Egypt. At the same moment that that Egyptian kingship emerged, we also saw kingships emerge in China, in Ireland, and in South America. The ancient name for the Egyptian kingship was Taru. Mm -hmm. In Ireland, it was Aru. In China, it was Iru. And in South America, it was Peru. Mm -hmm. So we have, again, commonality of naming convention here to say, here are four things that are related to each other. Oh my, those words all sound so much alike. You could tell there's a connection between the languages. <laughs> and right. so that's what I, part of what I do is I try to follow where these connections lead, even when they lead to some place that I think might not be possible, like the idea that Egyptians might have gone to northern Scotland at 3200 BC. I still follow where it leads me and try to sort out how does this make sense. My job is to validate what ancient cultures are telling us. Mm -hmm. and that's an incredible job. Do you mind? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I like yeah, it. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And may I speak a little bit about China, if you don't mind? Sure. Sure. Okay. So I, you have a book on it called China's Caught about China, and I want to start it off with chapter 11 in that book. He titled it The Zodiac. You wrote about the Chinese Zodiac and its animals. Can you briefly tell us about this? Uh, yes. The French anthropologist who studied the Dogen noticed that all of the component elements required for a Zodiac exist in Dogen culture in the right form. That we have um, a sequence of animals that are sort of zoological, but they carry uh, creational symbolism also. And they also have uh, Dogen symbolism has mm -hmm. a relationship to constellations in the, the sky and star groups and things like that. So the first real true zodiac that we find in history didn't appear till around 700 BC, but all of the elements seem to have been in place long before that. In China, those elements play out a little bit differently. Um, they play out in, in relation to a slightly different series sequence of animals because the idea with this instruction was that each culture was was had concepts represented by animals that were indigenous to where they lived. And so the symbolism of a cobra in India is very often the same as the symbolism of a rattlesnake in the, in the Americas. Mm -hmm. Or the symbolism of a hawk on Orkney Island in the Faroe Islands might be very similar to that of a vulture in another site. So um, there, there's some tailoring of these symbols to keep it self-reinforcing. The idea was a tribe member walks out of their hut and they see the things in their daily surroundings and that reminds them of what they were taught. And that helps keep the knowledge clear and fresh. So in China, um, there's a there's a difficulty because Things that happened around 3000 BC, we only know about because of texts that were written written down around 300 BC. And so there's this huge gap in time that allows mm -hmm. all the scholars to be in constant bickering mode with each other about what does what's the proper interpretation for this word or this symbol or this story or whatever. I noticed that the further back in time you go, the more commonality of language there is. Mm -hmm. And so I looked up the Egyptian words for animals that are pictured in the Chinese zodiac and discovered mm -hmm. that they were pronounced just like Egyptian words that are cosmological. 
In other words, each of these animals looks like they could have represented a cosmological concept. That's the same idea that seems to be supported at Gobekli Tepe, where you have many of these same animals pictured in ways that make it look as if cosmological concepts are being represented there. The idea that a hunter-gatherer could walk up to a pillar and see a picture of an animal that he knew the name of, and that that's the spot where he was going to be taught the concept of cosmology that was pronounced like that animal's name, that's a kind of a proto-writing. It's a pre-writing. It's a... Um, it's a picture writing, like a, um, a rebus puzzle, a child's rebus puzzle, where you see a picture of an eye and you're supposed to say eye. Yes, that's a very good example. And could you also be so kind to share a few examples on the symbolism of an animal that's not in the Chinese zodiac, but it is an important animal, the turtle? How does it play an important role? Um... One of them, one of the, the probably the, the initial one, if we're talking how the process of creation form is a dung beetle. In China, or in Egypt, the mm -hmm. dung beetle represents um, the idea of non-existence coming into existence. The dung beetle isn't pictured on the Chinese zodiac, oh, yeah. but it is a cosmological animal. Um, there are examples on the Chinese zodiac that aren't in the, aren't, um, immediately obvious in the other cultures, the idea of a dragon is is um, mm -hmm. presented like a serpent in other cultures, not a dragon in their variations. Uh, I think the the lion is pictured on the Chinese zodiac and is not um, a prominent animal in Dogen culture um, or among some of the cultures where lions weren't um, in the native environment that much. Um, but the, the general concept is the same, the idea that an animal is used to represent something. Um, a good example of how that works is the idea of a rabbit or a hare. Mm -hmm. One of the, the more noticeable attributes of a rabbit is that it, it quivers all the time. And so it was used as a symbol for the concept of vibration. Um, there's also a sense to the way these animals were put together, these animal symbols mm -hmm. were put together. Um, Yes. The symbolism gets to be so complicated that it's hard for someone who, like me who's coming in to research this stuff to know now, here's a new symbol. Where does it fall on this continuum of processes of creation? Where should That's it true. fall you know, towards one end or towards the other or in the middle? Where does it go? Well, so the Dogen culture gives us metaphors, four-stage metaphors that tell us where these symbols, they allow us to categorize the symbols. And one of those metaphors is based on the animal kingdom. It begins with insects like Kepper the dung beetle, then it moves to fish, then to four-legged animals, and then to birds. Mm -hmm. Now, when you go to ancient Egypt, you know, the Egyptian gods typically have the head of an animal. Well, I can predict, based on the Dogen metaphor, where the symbolism of the Egyptian god falls based on what animal head he has. Kepper has the head of an insect, a dung beetle. Uh, Thoth, who's the god of the written word, which is um, symbolic of an atom, falls at the other end of the scale, and he has a head of a bird. So there's there's rhyme and reason to this. That's part of why, as a programmer, I I came to understand that I was looking at a design system, and that makes a huge difference. When you know that somebody deliberately designed something, you can infer things about it that you wouldn't be able to infer if it was just a collection of random things. Definitely. The, and may I ask you a question about the invention of a magic screen, the importance of the numbers 8 and 9? This Because I read that in your book, and I thought it would be nice to bring up. This ultimately is a very important concept, especially when we come to ancient Egypt. Um, in Egypt, um, Egyptian mathematics um, was able to approximate certain numbers. They understood that a square that had eight units per side had the same area approximately as a circle that had a diameter of nine of those units. Mm -hmm. And that's a method of squaring the circle that was used in ancient Egypt. Uh, squaring the circle is a metaphor for reconciling the non-material with the material. It's a metaphor that appears again and again and again and again. 
that everything comes down to, hey, this is a metaphor for squaring the circle, which is a metaphor for reconciling non-material with material. Now, the Numo teachers embody the idea of the non-material becoming reconciled with the material. Mm -hmm. And in the philosophies that underlie this system, the idea of the scrolling energy, this energy is responsible for a process of reconciliation between the non-material and the material. So this is a very, very important um, concept. It's a central concept. And the magic square is one of the ways that that's represented. It's a way of another way. Uh, imagine that you were laying out a lesson plan right now for somebody who you didn't know what their frame of reference was going to be a thousand years from now. You didn't know what what their cultural references were going to be. What was their framework going to be? What What metaphors would they resonate with? And so almost everything in this tradition was given in multiple forms, mm -hmm. almost to the point of hitting it over the head. Um, on the, I think on the hope that we would understand one of the references. Mm -hmm. Yes, how interesting. And may I ask you, what is the Chinese concept of a mulberry tree, and can you relate it to the Dogons? The Dogon do have uh, concepts of a mulberry tree that I didn't understand when I was yes. first studying them. It, it constituted one of the loose ends. You know, as I go through and I'm studying a culture and they make certain references that are not well explained, I sort of set that aside and say, okay, I understand that this looks like it's important, but I don't have any reference to figure out how it's important. Mm -hmm. And so those sort of collect as a larger stack of things than what actually goes into the books I write. And every so often, a piece falls into place that pulls those together. Well, then when I went, wrote the China book, suddenly that concept of the mulberry tree pull, was pulled back together for me because the Chinese preserved that part of the, the mythology. Um, it looks as if originally, um, you're probably familiar with the concept of the tree of life. Yes. Well, there's also a tree. The mulberry tree was a, a comparable tree that was re represented... Uh, more of a cosmological thread than a biological one. It's sort of a parallel tree. And the mulberry tree, um, the reason the mulberry tree represented that was because of the way that berries and leaves are configured on the, on the plant itself. The berries were symbolic of particles, and um, the branches of the trees um, did certain things that um, uh, we see happen in the progressive stage of the creation of matter. So they, they were important. And there are there's a um, uh, there are myths where um, the berries on this tree are symbolic of suns, the same way that we have the sun glyph important in ancient Egypt. Um, the idea that an archer shoots the berries off the tree until they they only leave one that represents our sun. That's a metaphoric way of telling us about how the arrow of time that we experience relates to material creation and material creation is symbolized by the sun or the material universe is symbolized by the sun just as the non-material is symbolized by Sirius. How interesting and remember you did mention the tree of life and that has a clear association to the Kabbalah too. Yes, the Kabbalah actually there's a follow-on book that's already written to the Maori book that will be out in two, uh, I'll submit it in 2018 that deals with fundamental concepts of creation, scientific and mythological, trying to correlate some of the symbols that they're going to have that modern science doesn't talk about. And in that book, the, a lot of the confirmation comes directly out of the Kabbalah. Wow, that sounds like an interesting book, and I look forward for that to come out too. <laughs> yes, I, I feel badly about not being able to have these immediately available. Um, yeah. But it's sort of unfair to... Um, go into detail about uh, a book that somebody can't go out and, and yep. buy tomorrow if they wanted to learn more about it. Uh, it's also unfair to the publisher to to pre-announce things. The Sky Bray book, I sort of broke my own rule. I talked about it almost a year before it was published. Oh my! Um, <laughs> <laughs> that probably wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the end, I think it 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 helped the publisher's situation, and I think it um, it mm -hmm. um, made. It Possible for me to take the trip to the UK. There was a conference organized because of the book uh, that I was invited to speak at, and so it had its benefits. Well, then that's good to hear. I'm happy. <laughs> Frustrating for the the fans who are interested in hearing you. They keep hearing these rumors of a book. Where is that book? You know? 
I know it must be because I, I'm really excited to hear that. Like you, you just give us like a taste of your book, and I'm like, okay, what is it about? But of course, we just have no other choice but to wait, unfortunately. But I, I I'm sure everybody will be very curious and will be watching for those two new books. <laughs> yes, the uh, as yes. it turns out, from my perspective, the way mm -hmm. that. The processes of matter work are not really ultimately very mysterious. It boils down to a couple of of um, concepts of physics or features of physics that had to originally exist, and from those cu those couple of features, it really boils down a bit down to two processes. Everything else you can extrapolate. Um, even the things like they talk about the weirdness that happens in the quantum world compared to the atomic world. All of that just washes right out. There's, it doesn't really exist. It's sort of uh, uh, an illusion that we see because we don't understand what's really going on. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's what the book is about. Right. That sounds like it's going to be a great read, and I'm sure everybody will get into it. I'm happy to hear that you have new books coming, and please don't stop what you're doing. And <laughs> Could you please be so kind to share to the audience your show, social medias where people can find your stuff? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people after listening to you that want to check it out. <laughs> well, uh, Facebook is the easiest place to find me. I'm the only Laird Scranton on Facebook. I joke not not to confuse me with the other Laird Scrantons, but there aren't any. Um, <laughs> so that's people friend me there. They'll message me. What I've been realizing lately is that there have been people right along who've been messaging me that Facebook has filtered out the message because they weren't already friends with me. And so I've only just recently um, started paying attention to those, realizing that, that there's a, here's a message that's two years old that I never responded to because I didn't know it was there. Um, so it's probably better off if somebody friends me first and then tries to message me. Mm-hmm. Yes, and also they could check out your website where they could contact you there too, right? They could. That's really a fan site. It's not okay. my site, but the contact form there does reach me. It'll, it'll send an email to my email address, and so um, I have. You know, when I get an email from there, I do respond to people who try to contact me there. Well, your website is for the audience: www.leodscranton.com. Okay. Well. Thank you very much for making the time to come on to the Natalie Marie Hawk Show. This was a great interview, and I hope to interview you in the near future. Well, thank you. I hope to have more material for you to interview me about. So <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's exciting. Yay. And I would like yeah. to thank everyone who watched the Natalie Marie Hawk Show. You can check out my website, www.nataliemarieheart.com, or my other social medias. Love, peace, and harmony. Love you all.